morning. Well, I was over at Salem waiting for all you people this morning, and nobody showed up. It was kind of interesting this morning, though, we go for, uh, we go for the 9 o'clock service, and the people at Salem said, boy, we miss those Four Seasons people. <laughs> so I said, you know, 11 o'clock, we'll be glad to see you over there. Uh, seriously, isn't it great to be back? Thank you, Charlotte, for that overwhelming round of applause. <laughs> now, whenever we, whenever we come back, and we know we still have some things to do, um, but boy, is this a big change from where we were at. I can now stand up here without needing to wear a hard hat, which I think is really nice. No one has to look up there and say, uh oh, that plaster's coming down. <laughs> So that's good. I would just like to take a moment, though. I want to say a very special word of appreciation to John Schmidt. Okay. Um, John has has done not only a good job um, at at leading the trustees, and I want to recognize uh, our trustees who are with us. Butch Steiner. Has, is now part of our trustee group and a great, great contributor. <laughs> Pam Hugus is our <laughs> Pam Hugus is our upcoming trustee chairman as of 12:01 tomorrow morning, first of November. So what you can do uh, if if there is a problem, if there is a problem, call Pam anytime, anytime after one minute after midnight today and she'll take care of it. And also a, a special thank you to Bruce Van Kempema, who has been in, involved in this. And of course to Bob Allison, who was a trustee, um, and he was, he was part of this whole thing when it started. But I would like to say something very special about John, because John has done so much labor on this project. Whenever we do a church project, there are things budgeted for the insurance company, but when you can do that labor yourself, and so all the chairs were set in the sanctuary today by John. Uh, the carpet next door was pulled up by John. The carpet upstairs was pulled up by John. And so I think that's a really good example of what it means to be a servant. So thank you, John. Yeah. And actually, my son and I helped him pull up the carpet, so you're going to be getting a bill for my physical therapy. Uh, <laughs> no, I, walked in, I walked in one morning last week, and I see John was moving bookcases, and all I see, books all over the floor, and I see John's feet sticking out from under the bookcase. <laughs> but it's, uh, it's wonderful to be back, and it's great to be here with all of you, because we really do rejoice that we are God's people. And you know, we always say a, a church is not a building, and it's not. But when the people fill this building, we become the church. And it was so odd walking into this sanctuary and seeing just an empty sanctuary, not a thing in here, and thinking, this is a room. But this morning, this is God's church, and that's what we need to remember. Morning. And I echo that, not having to wear a hard hat here, so this is nice. <laughs> um, today's announcements, um, Morning Star is meeting on Tuesday at 9.30. All women of the church are welcome to attend and are encouraged to attend, if able. Um, Bible study this week will be uh, Salem at 10 to 11, and then COFS will be 6.30 to 7.30, both on Wednesday. Um, today we have, for those of you that are involved, we have a worship committee meeting after church today. And because we have an, we were supposed to have an outreach meeting next Tuesday or next Sunday, but I will be gone due to a baptism. So um, I'm hoping that the outreach team, and that includes everybody here that would like to come, will be on Tuesday uh, the 9th at 6.30. We have to start planning for our Thanksgiving dinner, so we're really excited about that. So, hope you can join us. Thank you. Now, on this day of our return, we've all walked into this building 
into this sanctuary carrying our lives, carrying those stories of our lives that guide us and burden us. But when we are here, we know the peace of Christ. And if this is your first time at, at Church of the Four Seasons, please make certain you see Linda before Li Linda, raise your hand. That's Linda. Uh, so we have your name. We will not contact you. We will not show up at your house. Uh, but we do like to send a little note to our, to our visitors and let you know how welcome you are at Church of the Four Seasons. So with that, let us extend to one another a sign of the peace we know in Christ and the love we experience through Christ. I tell you what, I'm about ready to go back to actually shaking hands with one another. <laughs> you know that? Next week for sure. All right, as those of you who were at Salem last week recall, we've made a slight change in the order of worship. Uh, we're doing the offering at the beginning of the service. We feel it's more appropriate to do it there than after the sermon. Um, I felt it almost was like I was taking an offering based up on whether you liked my sermon or not. So due to the fear that you might not contribute based on my sermon, we're now doing it at the beginning. And we also do the doxology, which really doesn't have a great deal to do with the offering. It's a, what we call a glory saying to God, and it's a wonderful way to, to go into our call to worship. So with that, let us present our gifts this morning. God, you are God who calls us to be about the work of continuing your good creation through acts of compassion, acts of empathy. You call us to be a people without judgment. You call us to be a people walking in a world with those whom we may not agree, but you call us to love them. May these gifts and the work of our hands, the words of our lips, and the thoughts held in the depth of our being build your kingdom proclaim your grace, and call people to walk in the light of your Son, in whose name we pray, amen. If you'd please remain standing for our call to worship. And prophetic words and healings actions, our Lord offered compassion. To the stranger, to the suffering, and to the outcast. Without judgment or condemnation, our Lord offered love. As we gather together today, we rejoice that our Lord taught us true compassion. Let us praise the one who has healed us. Amen. Our opening hymn, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds, hymn number 557.
This is that time in the service when we reflect on the joy that God gives us. And I could see as you walked in today, everyone felt good to be here. Felt good to be back in familiar surroundings, even though we had a wonderful time with our good friends at Salem. Many of you went on a tour of old Salem Church, walked through the cemetery where I spend a lot of time. And so it was joyful, wasn't it? Being united in Christ Jesus. And also, I have to say, one of my great joys this past week was the pastor appreciation. It is so important to a pastor and a pastor's family to feel appreciated, and I I have thank you cards you'll all be getting for the cards and gifts and words of support, but I'm very slow at thank yous, but I'm telling you today, thank you from the bottom of my heart. I would also tell you that a pastor is only as good as a congregation, and this is a great congregation, and I am so blessed to be here and so blessed to be at Salem and so blessed to know each of you. And that is the truest appreciation I need, is knowing the character, the strength, and the faith of this congregation. So that's my joy today. Other joys, and Linda has the microphone, so if you want to be on the air for your fan base, you need to wait for Linda. Other joys this morning. Debbie? Debbie? I had another angina of my angina attacks um, Saturday night, early Saturday morning. Um, I have what's called Prince Metal Angina, and it mimics a heart attack. And it happened at four in the morning. Rick's at work, and praise God, one nitroglycerin tablet worked. Um, I was able, Rick was able to talk me through it on the phone. I didn't need to call an ambulance, and I'm here today. Thank God. Thank well, God. Well, thank you. That's great. That's, that's wonderful. Thank you. Take care of yourself. Anyone else? Yes, Missy. Um, you have a microphone. I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, Friday night, we had trunk or treat. Obviously, it was raining and an awful evening, but we held it inside, and um, there was a few of us handing out candy, but we had between 80 and 100 kids come through. Wow. So it was a really wonderful, wonderful day. So... And we had a lot of parents just thanking us for keeping it and keep, you know, having it indoors and the kids were safe and dry. And so it was really a wonderful evening. That was great. And I thank you those to everyone who contributed. It was a great evening. Great evening. I won best costume. <laughs> Unfortunately, I wasn't wearing one. That was <laughs> Other joys. This You have pictures. Yes. <laughs> All right, I have money for you. I'll see you afterward. <laughs> All right, other concerns this morning, things we need to lift up. I know we have, yes, Barb. Uh, continue prayers for my uh, sister-in-law, Lori. Uh, she started her radiation this week for... Um, the tumors on her spine, um, and then on Friday she started the chemo, um, which has spread, uh, the cancer has spread um, mostly throughout her body. Uh, they did find some more um, tumors, and uh, so prayers for her and uh, her family. And then also my sister-in-law, Clara, her sister has been in the uh, nursing home in Hobart, and um, they're having another uh, medical challenge this week. So prayers for Juanita. Juanita, okay. We certainly will pray for both of them and uh, keep them in our prayers. Also continued prayers for Emerson. Any update on Emerson? Emerson has not had any more episodes since uh, since the problem started, so, um, and he's not able to get into this particular hospital until January, so we're just hoping that, uh, you know, that everything um, is okay up until that point. Very good, very good. We'll continue to lift him up in prayer. Yes, Paul. 
who is about to leave the area. Not because he doesn't like you all, no. <laughs> Uh, separate from the joy of the uh, beautiful leaves coming in with the sunlight on them this morning. We've had a contractor working at our house for the last week, and not only did they do a beautiful job, they finished on time, and, the, and the, his workers were fantastic. So we've had a great experience with a contractor. That's great. That's great. Would they like to come over here and finish up? <laughs> No, my wife said, thank you, Paul, and we, we will miss you. You're leaving shortly to head back to the West Coast. You know, it's, to, it's wonderful when you grace, our, our presence, you grace us with your presence. No, my wife said, because I've been over here with the contractors all the time, she said, you spend more time with the contractors than you do with me. And I said, well, if you learn how to drywall, we can spend more time together. You know? But anyone else? Suzanne. Please continue prayers for Arnold Anderson, who's uh, going to begin going, undergoing treatment for severe cancer. Thank you, Suzanne. And we, we will keep Arnold in our prayers. And it was so good to see him a couple weeks ago at, at church. It was just wonderful. All right. What I would ask us to do, this is a time of, of silent prayer. And I want us just to lift up in our hearts all of those people that we we have raised, you know. Barb has brought up her family members with health challenges, and we continue to pray for young Emerson and then for, for Debbie and all of those things, too, that remain in the silence of our hearts. But, you know, God calls us to respond in a very particular way. So we think about Arnold as well and, and everyone we've raised. And, and in each of your life, God is calling you to do something for each of these people. And I want us now to still our hearts. And, and when we do that, we need to become poor in mind and poor in heart. And what that means is we need to take away those things that might separate us from one another. We need to take away those things that might keep us from being compassionate, might keep us from being empathetic, might keep us from reaching out and lending a hand where it is needed or hope, or it might be missing. So let us now center ourselves in the stillness of a loving God who walks every journey, knows every joy, and carries us through every burden. you please join with me the prayer of confession. Holy God, a blind man rejected by his own people was given sight. Evil was conquered by the power of your son's mercy and the forgotten, the suffering, and the sinful felt the healing power of true love. In your son's acts of compassion, your grace was revealed for all time, yet we often fail to be people of compassion. We judge before we show kindness. We empathize only with those with whom we agree. In your mercy, forgive us for those times our judgment and pride have stilled our ability to be people of compassion. Renew us so that we may grow in the image of your Son. In Jesus' name, amen.
we now enter into what we call the pastoral prayer. And the pastoral prayer is simply where we lift up those concerns that were raised, those joys that were raised, we lift them up in our hearts, and also we join with all of Christendom in reminding ourselves of our mission, to be messengers of the good news, to be messengers of hope, to be compassionate, to be empathetic, to build God's good creation. So please respond, hear our prayer. Living God of hope, of purpose, and of love, May we be, at Church of the Four Seasons, a people of mercy, a people of grace, a people of welcome, a people of purpose. Lord, in your mercy, we pray for those who are burdened, those we have lifted up today who are suffering those who remain in the silence of our hearts and minds, that they may know your healing presence, that in the love we show, the compassion we offer, the mercy we we bestow, your love may be revealed, your hope may be lived, and they may know the peace of living in the light of your Son, Lord, in your mercy. For those who are held captive by the bondage of addiction, that they may find in the church of your son the gift of freedom, the gift of welcome, the gift of hope, Lord, in your mercy. For those who serve us as first responders, for our police officers, for our firefighter medics, for our EMTs, paramedics, those, those who are there in those moments when life isn't working, May they be comforted and may they know that their mission is a sacred mission, that in their work, in their service, in their dedication, in their sacrifice, they are revealing your love. Protect them, surround them with your grace, and guide them with your wisdom. Lord, in your mercy, for our nation to know your healing presence and and through your spirit to call each of us to be people of peace, people of justice, and people of hope. Lord, in your mercy, we offer all of these in the name of your Son, our Lord, our Savior, our Redeemer, and our Guide. Amen. We now take all of those prayers and we put them together in the perfect prayer, for it rises above just our needs rises above even the needs of a church or a people or a country. This is our appeal in praise and thanksgiving to the living God. And now for those of you who are comfortable, what I would ask us to do today, and if you're not, that's perfectly okay, if we could just join hands as we say this prayer. Let's stand. All right. Thank you. And let us, oh, this is very nice. Okay. Together, the people of Church of the Four Seasons, on this our return to this sanctuary, say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Today's Old Testament reading is coming from Zechariah, chapter 7, verses 8 through 10. And the word of the Lord came again to Zechariah. This is what the Lord Almighty said. Administer true justice, 
Show mercy and compassion to one another. Do not oppress the widow or the fatherless, the foreigner or the poor. Do not plot evil against each other. The word of God for the people of God. Now, if you please stand, if able, for the reading of the gospel, which is coming from Luke chapter 10, verses 30 to 35. In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him pass by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii, and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. <clears throat> Today we begin a new sermon series. And this is going to be one of the most challenging sermon series that I have ever done because we're going to all have homework. Now, you can't leave because I've already seen that you're here, all right? Because we're going to be talking about compassion. And we're going to be talking about what that really means. You know, we hear this story all the time of the Good Samaritan. One of those rare occasions when I actually went to Sunday school when I was a child I would always hear this story. Sunday school teachers love this story because they think it teaches us that we're supposed to render aid. But that's not really what this story is about. It's not just about rendering aid to someone visibly in need. It is about reaching out with compassion to another person. You know, sometimes the world, when we talk about the world today, it's almost like it's divided into two halves, right? Technically, it is divided into two halves, but that's not the point here. It's almost like we have the secular world, right? We say, it's all about me. I've got to make sure that I have everything I want. Because if I don't, somebody else is going to get it. Even at Trunk or Treat the other night, you can see little kids elbowing another little kid out so they could get more candy. And then I felt bad because I had to elbow that kid out so I could get more candy. <laughs> That's what I said, Pam, block for me, I'm going in. <laughs> Absolutely. But that's the reality, isn't it? It's all about us. I got my stuff and nobody else is going to get my stuff. And then there's the other part, and we call it the religious part. And sometimes in the religious part, what we think about, I'm heaven bound. I'm heaven bound. So I'm not going to worry about this world because it's not going to be my problem when I pass into God's glory. And we believe heaven is our destination, right? But we also have a job here. And that job is about compassion. That is the attribute, that is the hallmark, that is what it means to be a Christian. But sometimes I think we forget what the word compassion really means. Compassion is empathy with a direction. I love that line. I love that line. It came to me out of nowhere the other day. <laughs> I don't know how that happened. I was... <laughs> I was alone with my thoughts, and the Spirit of God came to me and said, Pastor Tom, I want you to say, compassion is empathy with direction. No, that came from Cheryl, who's got a wonderful, wonderful mind for these things. Because what does that really mean? What does that mean? You know, it's interesting, the word compassion has the word compass in it. Do you think about that? 
Empathy with direction means that we are doing it because we are building God's good creation. When we have empathy with direction, that's compassion. And when we have compassion, we are revealing God's creation to the world. We're not just simply sitting around waiting for this all to be over and we go to a better place. We are actually being empathetic to people who need that empathy. And the question is, who needs empathy? And the answer is, we all do. We all need that. And I know at the, at the early service at Salem, someone said, well, you better define what empathy means. That's an important thing because sometimes we forget it. We think empathy simply means, oh, I feel sorry for you. I feel bad for you. I'm going to cry with you, and I'm going to grieve with you, and I'm going to hurt with you, and I'm going to worry with you. That's emotional empathy. True empathy means I'm going to try to see the world from your perspective. I'm going to see the world from your perspective. And that's the only way I can offer compassion. Because what happens if we don't do that? What happens is our own prejudices, our biases, our worldview gets in the way. It gets totally in the way. So we can't really see the world from someone else's perspective. And so we are going to go on what I call the compassion challenge for the next four weeks. And the compassion challenge is going to help us, and I hope help me, understand what it really means to see the world through another's eyes. For example, if you walk into a hospital room, and I do that frequently, I just had to do that yesterday to visit a person who is very, very ill, struggling a great deal. And it was one of those days where I had so much going on, I said to myself, you know, I really don't have time to do this. And I, all the way up to the hospital, I was saying, oh, oh, if only I had Charlotte's phone number, so I would call her. If only, if only I had an associate to do this. And then I thought, wait a minute. What are you doing? You're a pastor. And one of the things, you know, I always do, I like when people are going into surgery, I like to pray them into surgery, and I like to pray with people in the hospital. I thought, but all of a sudden, my world was getting in the way of being a follower of Jesus Christ. And I spent the most marvelous time with this individual yesterday because suddenly I started to see the world as probably she was seeing it, and she's... She's worried now about going home, and she's, she's worried about the burden that'll be on her family, and she's worried about what her life is going to be like. And I felt an empathy with her, not just a sadness, but an empathy that she's seeing the world in that particular way. Now, it's interesting, though, because what keeps us from, what keeps us from being compassionate? Now, as people say things, oh, it's fear, let's look at the priest and the, you know, people walking by, the, the man beaten and robbed. No, you know what keeps us from being compassionate? When I was talking about doing this sermon series, I said, I want people each week to do a different act of compassion, and you all have your little blue cards, we'll go over those in a moment. But someone said, if you walk into Wise Way, okay, you walk into Wise Way, how are you going to pick the person you're going to do an act of compassion for? And I immediately said, because I'm the pastor, so I immediately have the answer to any question you may ask. I immediately said, well, I'll look for the person who appears to be the most in need. I'm going to look for like the single mom who's at the, in line and she, you can see her counting her money to make sure she can pay for those few items she has. Obviously, she's in need. Or I'm going to look for the older person who's, who's moving kind of slowly through the aisles, and, and they're going to be in need. And, or I'm going to look for the person who's not very well-dressed. I'm going to say they're going to be in need. And then the person I was talking to reminded me of something very important. I'm basing compassion on judgment. We all, friends, have a story. We all have a brokenness, we all have a need, we all have a problem, we all have a burden. And we can't tell by looking who is in need. But unfortunately, we tend to be willing to help those 
Help those that seem less than us. Help those that seem they haven't been as blessed as we are. Well, that's not the case at all. You know, one thing about the story of the Good Samaritan, we really don't know how that guy ended up there. You know, we hear the story that he was robbed and, and beaten, but what really happened? Was he trying to rob somebody and got beaten up? We don't know. We don't know his story. Did he have money? Did he not have money? What really happened? We don't know that story. And we don't know the story of anyone we encounter. So judgment is the first thing that bars our compassion. But then what about empathy? Empathy, seeing the world through another's eyes. You know what it is that keeps us from being empathetic? We are only empathetic with people we agree with. If you agree with me, I'm going to be really empathetic, okay? If you agree with my theology, my anthropology, my sociology, my ideology, I'm going to love you, okay? I'm going to love you. But if you disagree with me, oh boy, I don't know. <laughs> You're on your own, you know? So this month, these four weeks, as we prepare to go into Advent and our, our sacred season of welcoming, welcoming God among us, Emmanuel, we're going to take a challenge. And as you walked in, you were given a little blue sheet. Each week, there is a different challenge. But remember, you have to do it without judgment. You have to do it without just looking for someone you agree with, okay, or who agrees with you. It's not going to work that way. The very first week, I want you to do an act of compassion, which could be a simple act of kindness, helping someone out, reaching out to someone, giving them a particular blessing, but to a total stranger. And I don't want you to judge who really needs it, because God may guide you to the person that day who needed it more than anybody. I want you to reach out to a, a total stranger, okay? You know, just walk into a grocery store, reach out to a stranger. Or if you're visiting someone in the hospital, Stop in the room with someone you don't know, just to say, I'm here for you. Just a stranger, no judgment. You might be surprised. That's week one. And then I want you to reflect on those questions we have. What did you do? Where did you do it? What was the response? Because the value of a gift of compassion is only realized in the eyes of the recipient. And then how did it make you feel? You don't have to write it down on a little blue sheet. You might want to journal it. You want to keep notes. And I would love to hear the response. And then the second week, which will be after our service on the 7th, I want you to do that for a first responder, a policeman, firefighter, medic. Someone that is there when life goes afoul, you know? An act of compassion. You know what? They need an act of compassion as much as anybody particularly in this day and age, you know? It's a very thankless job, often a thankless job. Act of compassion. But in week three, it gets harder, okay? So far, the stranger, we can do that, right? We can run into a stranger and do something compassionate and try to see the world through their views, maybe just a conversation. That's something I find is so wonderful when I talk to someone and they share their story and it's a blessing to them. But week three we're asked to do an act of compassion for that difficult family member. We all have a difficult family member. If you don't have a difficult family member, you're not telling the truth. But if you really don't have a difficult family member, I have several I will gladly share with you. <laughs> Trust me. And I have someone in mind in my family who totally disagrees with me. She absolutely, totally disagrees with me on virtually every single issue. But we're married, and we're going to stay married, and, uh, you know, <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> no, 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 no. Can we cut that out of the tape, Mike? <laughs> yeah. No, the reality is that, that there is a person in our family who is, believes very differently than me in theology, and she believes very differently than me in, in ideology, and she believes very differently than me in many things, and I'm going to reach out and extend to her an act of compassion. And I will say something like, 
even though you really don't seem to have a clue about how things work. No, 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 no. No, no I will, <laughs> yeah. I am going to extend to her an act of compassion, an act of empathy, where we totally disagree, but that doesn't stop me from showing her that I love her. And then the final week is the most difficult. The final week we have to show an act of compassion to someone who has broken a relationship with us, someone who has betrayed a trust, someone who has, has been untrue to us, someone who has hurt us. And that's a true act of compassion. And you can see as we go through this exercise, this challenge, the goal is to grow as people of faith because compassion and empathy, that is our calling as followers of Jesus Christ. That is our calling as followers of our Lord and Savior because every act that Jesus did, every miracle that we read about, every great accomplishment that Jesus had started as an act of compassion. Do you think he agreed with the people that he touched? He ate with sinners. He ate with, peop he, he, he ate with people who had turned from God. He called Zacchaeus the tax collector who was exploiting the Israelites working for the Roman Empire. He healed Jairus' daughter, a leader of the synagogue, when the Pharisees and scribes were trying to trick him. He reached out to the leper, and he saw the world through their eyes because God gave him that ability, and he saw that they were rejected, exploited, persecuted, and isolated. And that's what we are going to do over these four weeks. We're going to see the world through other people's eyes, and it starts out easy with a total stranger. And then it's someone who serves us. And then we get to the hard part. We get to the hard part where we begin to say, this Christian life isn't all that easy, is it? Because now I have to touch and love someone with whom I totally disagree. And then it gets real hard because I have to say, now I have to reach out and touch and love someone who has hurt me, who has broken me, who has violated my trust. And that's what Jesus did, and if we're to grow in his image and likeness, that is what we are to do. And you know, today, later on, we will sing what is my all-time favorite hymn, Bob's favorite hymn, Here I Am, Lord. And that's what this is. Here I am, Lord. Is it I? I've heard my people cry. Is it I? Yes, it is. And we're, sometimes I even like to change that last line. I'll go, if you send me. Friends, it's not if. We are sent. It is I will go where you send me. That's an act of compassion. That's an act of empathy. That's an act of Christ. And that is our call. Amen. Let's pray. Almighty God, you have called us this day to hear your mighty word. May our hearts be filled with the joy of your re reconciling grace. Lead us from this place to be messengers of the good news as we live lives of compassion, speak words of love, and offer hope to all who cry out to know your abiding mercy. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you'd please stand for our closing hymn, Here I Am, Lord, hymn number 593.
wonderful way to conclude our service today, because that's really the message, you know? Here I am, Lord, send me. That's what we're called to do. So I thank you all for joining with us today. Thank you, Cheryl, for a wonderful job. We love having you here. And thank you for your good advice on sermons. <laughs> Any complaints on the sermon, you can see Cheryl after the sermon. After the, yes. Cheryl also has served at Crown Point First, and, and the lead pa senior pastor there, Mark Wilkins, and I are good friends. And now that we both are working with Cheryl, we're meeting weekly in just kind of a group session we have. You know? No, uh, she's beloved there, and she is beloved here, without a doubt. And so I thank all of you. Thank you, Missy, for a wonderful job. And Mike and Ann and Chris, it's good to see you back there. Thank you so much. They were working, uh, Mike and Ann were here um, well into the night on Friday night. They were here yesterday getting the tech booth back into shape, and thank you. Very much appreciated. So we, and I appreciate all of you. And so now it is my blessing to ask us each to remember God's blessing. And you know what the main blessing that God gives us is? We're called to serve. That's the blessing. We're called to carry that good news. May the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ touch and transform each of your hearts in ways that are real, in ways that are challenging, in ways that are comforting. May the love of God protect each of you gathered here today as you go about your earthly journey. And for each step that you take, each breath that you take, each moment in your life, may you do so in full communion with God's Holy Spirit. Let us go in peace to love, to serve, but most of all, to carry God's compassion to everyone we meet. Amen. And as is our custom here at Church of the Four Seasons, we will conclude with our recessional, let there be peace on earth.